gentlemen salutations to everyone out there listening welcome to another special episode another week <coughs> most unapologetically black unfiltered uncensored podcast speak to the mic i am your illustrious host marlon joseph and today's episode is a very special one to me because it's something that we obviously have to attack and deal with more specifically when it comes to administering the very help that we need to have from a mental health standpoint. And so um, these two black, prominent black men in this particular area of mental health and counseling uh, are doing great things for the black community, more specifically us and, and being a representative, being representatives of the black community from a black man's perspective, where I really have tremendous uh, admiration and respect for uh, and definitely appreciate all the work that they're doing and appreciate them for taking the time to be on this show. Dr. Romero Hofstad, he is a clinical mental health counselor, more specifically in the area of cognitive, cognitive uh, behavior therapy. Uh, and Dr. David Ford, who is a huge advocate for administering the very help and mental health, mental health specifically, uh, the mental health need for minorities, uh, the black community, uh, the LGBTQ community, and as well as those who are affected by HIV and AIDS. So gentlemen, thank you all so much for being on this show, especially to talk about this very thing that has been very much so hidden from us when it comes to unpacking the very issues that we have to deal with <laughs> black people, more specifically black men. So thank you guys for taking the time to be on this show to talk about these issues. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, man. Thanks for the invitation. So glad to be amongst such great black men. Absolutely, man. And uh, listen, I appreciate you all for all the many works that you guys are doing in your profession. And here on this show, we like to provide informational content to our to the black community. We also like to acknowledge those uh, black men and women, regardless of profession, uh, the very works that they're doing to impact and, and very much so uh, influence real change in the black community as well as give those, give those individuals their flowers for doing what they do in real time when it comes to, you know, contributing to the culture moving forward, so to speak. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Again, I, I greatly appreciate you guys for being here. I want to start off um, more specifically from a, pro from a professional standpoint, just so I, I researched this, right. And I saw that there was this pyramid complex or pyramid process when it came to representation. So from a representational mm -hmm. perspective, you have black people, you have black women more specifically, and then you have black men. And each and every one of those phases of that pyramid, when you look from, when you go from down, when you go from up to down, you see that the, the percentage actually goes down tremendously. And so with us living in a society where representation still matters, we're seeing more black women in this profession than we do black men. And from you guys' perspective, uh, Romero, I wanna start with you first on this question. What, from your perspective, what what do you think uh, is the is the cause and factor to why not enough black men are represented in this particular field and profession? Yeah, so it, it's always interesting. Like whenever I've done talks and I've kind of talked about mental health and you know really spreading awareness about the field and about very you know these various issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, it's always intriguing because a lot of people are like, "Oh, what got you into mental health?" You know. Why were you involved in psychology? What kind of sparked that interest? Um, and I think for a lot of people, they, they don't see that representation, which is the reason why I think it sparks the question a lot of times. Um, and it's interesting because when I talk to other people, particularly Black men, about why there's not as much representation, a lot of it comes down to there's just certain things that there's a little bit more effort to recruit black men into certain fields. And then in our field, for whatever reason, that doesn't seem to be as prevalent of trying to recruit black men into counseling, into psychology, into social work. Um, but in addition, on the flip side, there's individuals who are like, I don't know if that's for me because I don't know if I want to talk to people about, you know, some of these issues and these vulnerabilities on a regular basis, maybe because kind of like what we're going to talk about today, um, sometimes in the community, there's so much stigma related to mental health 
And so if I'm going through kind of the stigma where I don't feel comfortable talking about these issues, how am I then on the flip side going to be a mental health professional and work with individuals who are struggling with that very same thing? Um, so I, I think I think there's a lot of reasons to it. I don't think there's a single reason why there isn't as much representation. But I will say I think there has been uh, more effort, especially in recent years, to improve those numbers. Um, and I've, I've also seen in, in many programs those numbers mm-hmm. increase, which has been really nice. And I think a lot of that, and, and David, I, I'll be interested to see if you agree with me on this, I think as stigma has decreased over the years and we're still nowhere near, near where we need to be, yeah. um, but I think as mental health stigma has decreased over the years and there's been more awareness about the importance of talking about these issues and having more representation, I think that's led to more people being interested um, mm-hmm. So hopefully that will continue to improve, yes. especially you're seeing like a lot of athletes, a lot of celebrities talking about it mm-hmm. it's at the forefront. And I was speaking to a psychologist <laughs> not too long ago. And, um, you know, she was saying a lot of athletes want to see more black men in sports so that they can have someone to relate to and to connect to. And so I think that also is going to increase recruitment um, over the years. But I think there's a lot of reasons to it. So I think it's history. I think it's the stigma. I think it's Uh not not having that comfortability with, you know, going there with personal vulnerability and talking about some of these issues, recruitment. I think there's a number of things there. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny as you say that too, Uh because like you said, I I do think that the, the, the stigma behind mental health from a professional standpoint, obviously there's not enough initiative being pushed out there to get, to recruit or get more black people, more specifically black men into this realm, because I see the numbers being drastically different compared to black women. Black women are, are hugely uh, represented when it, when it comes to comparison to black men, but they still uh-huh. Under, uh-huh. underrepresented too, when you still think about it on a grander scale from other ethnicities, right? right? So uh, David, for you, as far, as far as that initiative go, why, why would you say, or to your perspective, what uh-huh. would be the reasons that, that recruitment or that that initiative is not even put forth towards this particular uh, profession. And see, okay, and, uh, my main job is teaching in a graduate counseling program. Yeah, and um, I see the difficulties in getting more black and brown individuals in general into the counseling profession. Yeah. Part of it are um, includes the barriers that black and brown folks facing to get into graduate school in the first place. Okay. And graduate school is expensive. It's high as hell. Yeah. And then you got the barrier of the GRE to get in. And then the, then not many faculty mirror black and brown communities. So that's a deterrent. You know, you, you, you already have the stigma that, that there's only outside that, you know, that about mental health in the black community. And then, you know, even though there are a few HBCUs that have counseling programs, there aren't that many that are taken for credited. Absolutely. And so most of the time, you know, they're applying to PWIs. And then when they look at the faculty, faculty don't don't look like them. Yeah. But that's because there aren't that many of us at the master's level that, that then you know, as you go into the doctoral level to get your 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 um, degree to be able to teach, that gets even smaller. Yeah. And so there's a is it even a larger lack of representation in teaching. So they're like, well, why go to graduate school to come into a profession that's mostly white, learn about white people and to be taught by white people and to be in class with a whole bunch of white people. Yep. That's very true. And it's unfortunate that that's the case too, especially given yeah. that I, I, I did see that oftentimes with out of 10 applicants who are applying for grad school, you may have one or two who are black, but then Mm -hmm. to have, but so many of them being accepted at at, at one particular semester or one year or whatever, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that, that pretty much dwindles down the possibility of those two black students actually getting approved versus them picking one or the other. Right. And and that's that's a a huge problem when it comes to Mm -hmm. just being accepted from your point, uh, as far as just fully out, just, enrolling into the grad program to become counselors but obviously you have different areas of counseling that people oftentimes go to 
Uh, my other question in regards to this professional, from a professional standpoint, David, start with you on this. Um, what would be more of the area that you see Black people specifically going into when it comes to mental health uh, or just mental health counseling in general? Like, what's the more commonly known area that Black people tend to go to or lean towards? Oh, um, more often than not, I see more Black people going into um, mental health counseling as opposed to, you, you have mental health counseling, you have school counseling, you have addictions counseling, um, and those are the those are the main thing. You have major family counseling out there, and so what we tend to see is you know mainly people going into mental health and school counseling. Yeah, and, and I wonder why that is. Yeah, but I'm thinking that most of your programs are either mental health or school. I wish we had more. Uh, people that went into like addictions and career counseling, uh, major family counseling. Um, we also see some that go into um, pastoral counseling, which is, you know, regulated by the American Counseling Association. So they're also, you know, um, licensed counselors that integrate spirituality into their practice in an ethical way, in a culturally inclusive way. And so we see a lot of um, like we're going to that area as well. Yeah. Um, but mainly it's the more the mental health aspect of counseling. Okay, and you know what, Romero and I talked about this uh, briefly earlier before the show started. And he was he, he kind of touched on one area of counseling that he wished he had gone into, and I want to ask you a question about that too. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was from a military. <laughs> was it uh, Romero? Oh, oh no, no. So it wasn't that I was going to go. I was I was interested in it once upon a time. So yeah. I'm I'm very happy with what I'm doing now as a counselor <laughs> in psychology. But, but that, 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 but Don't misquote me now. Don't misquote me on this podcast. <laughs> I mean, of course, you're on that, but I was saying you was curious to to possibly go like go into that area of counseling when it comes to like military, like, yeah. like military, right? So, I, yeah, I, so I was inquiring about that. Yeah, yeah, you know I'm messing with you. Like, don't miss no miss me. But, but honestly, that's where that's where we're lacking in counseling in general. Yeah, because yeah. you know, um, for whatever reason, we need more of mental professionals working with those that are on active duty and those that are veterans. Absolutely, yeah, because they, they need the support. Yeah, yeah, they need the representation as well. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. That you know, PTSD is real, right? So. Oh yeah. And, oh yeah. But more specifically, when you come, when it comes to being a black person dealing with PTSD, PTSD is in our everyday life. It's in our everyday fiber, unfortunately, because what the the very issues that we've been subjected to mm -hmm. you know, in, in our in, in our everyday lives, you know, growing up and our upbringing and the very societal issues that we've had to deal with, it it oftentimes get so exhausting waking up being black sometimes. And being a black man with so much yeah. pressure that's added to your everyday life mm -hmm. your itinerary, it's like, okay, now I have to deal with this, this, and this on top of still being professional in my profession. I have to still be upbeat and positive. <laughs> I still have to carry this sort of representation or rep reputation to where, all right, you don't see that I'm dealing with a lot of different things, right? And it's not is not paying enough attention to the very things that we have to unpack. Now, now this is leading to a cultural, uh, from a cultural standpoint, is this next question that I have for you guys. Mm -hmm. and, and David, I want to start with you on this. So from a cultural standpoint, as black men, we oftentimes have been told that, all right, it's not a big deal. Shake it off, deal with it, or don't deal with it. Move it on, move on to the next thing, or sweep it under the rug. You're a man. You're not supposed to have emotions. You're not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to do any of that. Now, we're seeing much more of that that outward pour when it comes to you know just revealing ourselves to someone from a mental health standpoint from our millennial generation versus the generation mm -hmm. of our parents and the generation of theirs now what would be some of the factors from your perspective as to why our generation is much more vulnerable if you will when it comes to all right you know what it is okay to not be okay and i'm going to talk about it i want to be able to get to a place where i'm coming to some form of resolution to have to deal with this because we know that it's not gonna it's, it's Rome didn't take it, it it didn't take two days or a day to build Rome. So it's uh -huh. over time we have to understand that it's gonna take us time to be able to cope with certain instances of our mental health and being able to still operate functionally in our everyday lives. So 
Uh, I know it was a, a, a loaded question, but I want to know from you, what would, what would you say from your perspective was the, it's like some of the determining factors as to why our generation of all, of all of the ones that would, came before us are unpacking those things now in, in the mental health uh, culture? Okay, so I think one, one, thing, one thing we're seeing is that that way of thinking, that, that, that toxic masculinity is not working. Yeah. And, it's, and it's doing more harm than good. Yeah. That whole, you know, men don't cry, men don't show emotion. That the phrase man up, which is some bullshit, it is. you know, you know, that that's that's not working for us. And then one thing that I alluded to before, you know, we as a people don't like this whole it's, it's not okay to be okay. And it's also it's okay to not be okay. You know, I'll say this much, and you know, I'm I'm the choir director, church pianist, I'm saved. <laughs> All that stuff, yeah. but the church has fucked us up in so many ways. He has, and you know what? That, that's a conversation that we're gonna have. To yeah, have to it has, and and I and I say that because you know I'm happy in Jesus alone. No matter what's going on outside, I'm not gonna fear. I, you know, I'm not going to be depressed. I can pray the depression away. You know, um, God, uh, you know, I, I have no reason to stress. I have no reason to fear. I'm not supposed to be unhappy, and and that's not even biblical. No, it's not. That's not biblical at all. You know, it's also not possible. It's, it's not. Po possible. Thank you. You're Thank human. you. It, you're you're human. Human things. And exactly. And even from a biblical standpoint, faith without works is dead. It's dead. You just pray it off or pray it away. You got to actually put in the work to do something about it too, though. And God, can I, can I jump in on that, Marla? Yeah, yeah, by all means, go be, be, no, because what we're seeing too is that you have a lot of Christians and a lot of people with from religious backgrounds that are saying I'm struggling because I'm battling depression or I'm battling anxiety. I'm battling a lot of different things, but I don't feel like I can talk to the church about these things for the reasons that David just mentioned. Yeah. And, and that's difficult because we always say when it comes to physical health, if you injure yourself or you need medical attention, Everybody's going to support you going to the doctor, going to the hospital, mm -hmm. getting treated mm -hmm. for whatever that condition is, right? Because you can pray about it. And again, this is nothing against prayer, but at the same time, that ACL that you just tore is going to need treatment to get you back to where you need to be. Absolutely. And physical injury. And a lot of times we can put a timeline on physical injury. We know this from sports, Marlon, where it's like this player is out for three weeks because of this particular injury or whatever. When it comes to emotional injury, it's a whole different ball game. And a lot of times emotional injury can be more impactful than physical injury. Absolutely. And yet there's kind of this mentality of, especially as it relates to religion sometimes is, you know, pray about it, you know, or you shouldn't have any doubts or any, you know, anything that you're going through, like you shouldn't even worry about it. Like it should be taken care of. But there's a lot of people that, yeah, I do pray about it. But at the same time, I just need that human element to say, hey, what you just shared with me and what you're going through, that sounds rough. That sounds difficult. And just getting that support and that goes a long way. Another thing I want to kind of go back to as well is relate to your question is I think also just us as a people, like surviving is in our nature, right? It's you yes. push through, you compartmentalize. You get through, you don't let anything bother you, but we're not built that way as human beings. We all have a breaking point where it's like we and we need. So anytime I think about this, I always think about a client when I was doing my psychology residency at Northwestern. And I'll never forget her because I, I, I just love what she said. She was like, at what point do we get to stop surviving? At what point do we get to just live? Absolutely. And, and I think that's real in a lot of ways. I think all, a lot of us get caught up in that where year in and year out, everything is survival mode. And when you think about it, we're on this planet for a finite period of time. And there's only so much surviving that we can do before our time. Do we get Yeah, of course. 
unfortunately that's not happening, which can be Marla. Hey guys, did, did I lose you right there? Are you guys still there? Yeah, we lost that place. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Was an issue. Uh, apparently, something just stopped. We're here. Going. Yeah, still here. Okay, okay. We, yeah, we still we, we're still on. Yeah, um, but yeah, it, it is. It's very unfortunate that we that we deal we have dealt with this issue of not dealing with mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, especially as black men, we're told to toughen up and, like you said, man up. And that doesn't work. Uh -uh. And uh -uh. Because it has. It, ha it hasn't worked all this time. And so not being able to deal with and unpack issues that we deal with every day only makes matters worse. And, and, and everyone has a tolerance level, right? So we know what we can tolerate and what we can't. Once it gets to that tolerance level, and, and it can't get in, can't get any further than that. Now, uh -huh. point now. Now I'm blowing the hell up on any damn body that says something stupid or wrong to me. And it's not necessarily that person's fault that I'm I'm reacting that way, but it's because it's been boiling up inside me to just lash out at somebody at some point in time in life. And so, and a lot of that emotional, those emotional issues have to be dealt with head on, and right then and there. Because the longer you wait. The more shit is going to get worse, and it's going to yes. ultimately yes. affect your yes. physical health. And so, and mm -hmm. remember, you had touched on that uh, before before the show started, where over fifty percent of what we deal with physically is is predicated on our mental stability or, or lack thereof. Right. So we're dealing with so many different yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, mm -hmm. all that stress yeah. that we deal with, and it's like, and stress look different for everyone, and I and I understand that. So what may stress you out may not stress me out, but it's not to say that I don't have anything, any stressors at all. And so we all, we all kind of find, find not so pleasant or not so good outlets to help us suppress those stress levels. Like whether it's drinking, whether it's partying, whether it's, you know, over, overly socializing on social media, these types of things really drive home the very mental health issues that we, we, we are faced to deal with now more than ever. Because of so yeah. many added layers yes, to yes. society that we have to deal with now that our parents didn't have to deal with. Now, I mean, I mean, social anxiety is still social anxiety, but <laughs> it's been exacerbated more so now with the creation of social media. Now you have but one thing though. That. But, so Marlon, though, I would say I would challenge that statement that they didn't have to deal. I think they had to deal with it too, just that they dealt with it in in in, in sometimes not so healthy ways. Absolutely, and then. And and so now we're saying that those ways that they dealt with it weren't healthy and weren't productive because like you know, I'm I'm a 70s baby. Yeah. And so I'm Generation X. All right. You you hardly ever heard of like my parents' generation talking about going to see a counselor or going to see a mental therapist, you know, and and that generation, they dealt with mental illness that they stigmatized it. Yeah. And they were like, you know, suck it up. You're all that phrase. Oh, you, we, uh, depression's for white people. We're too, we're too poor to be depressed. Exactly. You know? And so we're seeing that as, as generations, you know, progress, we're becoming more and more open to having those conversations with a licensed mental health therapist. And I said licensed mental health therapist. Absolutely. Because we have to, because now this is another thing too that I haven't touched on because... I see a lot of shit, especially on social media, when it comes to people want to be life coaches. Not, I'm not dismissing or casting any aspersions on anyone's profession whatsoever on the show, because I commend whatever work ethic and whatever profession that you're mm -hmm. in that contributes to the culture, the cultural improvement of our our black community. I appreciate yeah. that tremendously. Now, having said that, we can't dismiss that there are not false professions or false prophets if you will it's out here spewing a lot of bullshit and uh propaganda and, and and basically trying to control the narrative and saying the complete opposite of what these very uh licensed professionals like yourselves are actually out here practicing and doing those mm -hmm. those things typically enough conflict with the actual facts and the information that's being put out there or should be put out there to our black community to better help a system with dealing with these anxiety issues. And that has to be said more times than not, because 
you, you got too many opinions, not enough goddamn facts to go off of. And I've always said that if your opinion don't have some facts in it that actually help you form that opinion, then your opinion needs to fall on deaf ears. It, you, you're talking for the sake of hearing your deaf ears. Shut the hell up. Exactly. Shut the hell up because your opinion should not matter to anyone. And I've always said that so much misinformation, the most dangerous tool to use against humanity is misinformation because yep. it, it basically gravitates to the gullibility of stupid people who believe stupid shit. We have too much misinformation <clears throat> and too many misinformationers, <laughs> if you will, putting it out there. Like everyone now has a perspective on something. And that within itself can cause and drive your anxiety through the goddamn roof with so much mm -hmm. information to, to being consumed on social media or just through media in general. It's, it's an everyday struggle to have to deal with, which a lot of times I have to even tell myself this, let alone even my wife telling me this. OK, put your phone down or turn the TV off because you're consuming we're, we're, we're consuming too much of this information that has been very much so discouraging and dispersing to us as black people. We carry that through our everyday lives now. Now, what we just saw or what we just listened to or read, now it's affecting our moods now. And that's something yeah. that within itself we have to unpack too. And so from that standpoint, like you said, some people just need to just shut the hell up and let the professionals deal with these issues head on the way they, they, they were trained to do. And we're not seeing enough of that. So again, as far as the very stigma that's been put out there, uh, in the black community with not dealing with issues healthy enough, right? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of unhealthy outlets. And a lot of times if we don't deal, like I said, if we don't deal with it now, it's going to happen later and it's going to be exacerbated. From your professional standpoint, I'll start with you, David. How, how what are some of the ways that our generation, the, the, the millennials, if you will, who are basically unpacking a lot of these issues more now than ever, would you say that this is a better question? Would you say that this has become a trend or this is now becoming much more of an uh, everyday norm for us as black people? Um, I, first of all, let me let me let me let me applaud the millennial generation for kind of leading the charge. You know, I'm, I'm a big I'm a big fan of the millennial generation because I think they're natural born leaders. Yeah, they took. They took the the, the, the the fucked up shit that the baby boomers did to us and then sometimes the, the ways that we carry on the fucked up shit and 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 try their best to change to change it and they're working towards it. So I gotta give my hats off to the millennials. Absolutely. Um I think because of that and because of how much more open we are to having conversations about mental health and destigmatizing mental health and and having greater emphasis on seeking out mental health professionals and becoming licensed mental health professionals i think you know this is not just a trend but something that's permanent and i'm hoping that it continues and and reaches especially those naysayers that did not see the value in it before and they see that, hey, the stuff that we did, you know, you know, just wasn't cutting it. And so maybe we need to, you know, seek out the same help that the younger generation is, is seeking out and um, stigma of mental health that's still out there, especially in our community with younger clergy. I gotta get my hats off to my pastor, Dr. Samaj Van Sand at Second Baptist Church in Asbury Park, um, because he is very adamant about mental health and seeking out licensed professionals yep. and in having those conversations about spirituality and counseling and how you know spirituality can take you so far. Sometimes you gotta you have to go to see someone else. He says, You got three sessions with me and I'm referring you to someone else. Absolutely. My hat, my hats off to our fraternity brother, Dr. Howard John Wesley, at um, Alpha Street in Alexandria, who prioritizes mental health, even with folks in the church castigating him for doing so and doubting his 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 um spiritual strength. 
he prioritized his mental health, took a break, and said, I need a mental break and a physical break. Yeah. So what we're seeing is not only do we are we seeing it from the, the millennial generation, and we're seeing it from younger clergy who see the emphasis and the importance of prioritizing mental health and look in, in, in attacking it from a holistic standpoint, not the, just the spiritual guidance, but also um, the, the, the mental health guidance from a licensed professional. Yeah, and you know what? It's funny you say that too, because my mm-hmm. pastor, uh, Matthew L. Brown, here at Greater Community Church and God in Christ uh, in, in the Atlanta area speaks to that very plight, right? He, he talks about how this, I am here as your spiritual teacher, but God, God has blessed us with doctors and of all facets and all aspects to go to, to, to seek that help that we obviously need in those particular areas. Now, obviously we're in the, we're in the, in the business of healing, right? But Mm-hmm. We understand our place in, in, in this world and in the Black community more, more specifically and understanding that we are to help them get the help that they need. Now, yes. he also yes. even talked about that from a financial standpoint. He's like, listen, if I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep praying for you, but guess what? If you're not doing the work, then, then you ain't going to get no money. Like, you ain't going to get <laughs> no job. Like, you, you ain't going to get that 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 increase in, in your, your, your promotion. Mm-hmm. Or like, Fake without works is dead. And the, and the older generation always talked about pray this, pray this, pray this off. And it's like, but you're not doing the work. And because they oftentimes m- misunderstand certain translations in the Bible when it talks mm-hmm. about standing still, it's like, well, you still have to do the work though. You, you still have work to do, right? So God has blessed you with the knowledge of common sense and the know-how to mm-hmm. get ahead in life, not just to pray to him mm-hmm. and stand that, okay, he's going to fix it. But he gave you the tools and know how to do it yourself too, so we have to do yeah. our parts, uh, especially. So yeah, I mean, so- I think that's a good point, Marlon. Because honestly, I think that's not talked about enough. There's a lot of pastors that are struggling because they're not trained for mental health related issues. Mm-hmm. But the congregation sees them that way. Of oh, can you just pray for me? Or oh, pastor, can you help me with this particular thing? And to your point. The pastor can help up to a certain extent, but then many pastors are saying, you're going to have to see a mental health professional related to the things that you're talking about. And they're catching a lot of heat because it's like, what do you mean you're going to refer me? Why can't you help me? And there's a lot of pastors, and we see this in research, that are struggling with mental health because of not only that, but also a very high level of expectation related to them Mm -hmm. individuals Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So that's not fair on a lot of different levels. You go to a general provider, we all have medical checkups. And if there's a higher level of care that you need, that general provider will say, I'm going to give you this referral to this particular specialist. Mm-hmm. And we accept that, or many people accept that in that context. That's the same thing that's happening in the context of peers or in the context of religion, where the pastor says, I'm going to make this referral to this professional for a higher level of care. Or a peer says, hey, I want to be empathic, I want to be supportive, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to refer you to a psychologist, counselor, social worker, whoever, who can better help you. But for some reason, sometimes there's still some some boundaries there, which I think needs to continue to be talked about. Yeah, because a lot of times they say, you know, most of the congregation is saying, oh, God is all I need. I don't need nothing else. Well, actually, you do, because God Mm -hmm. placed these professionals on this earth more specifically in these areas for you to deal with and, and talk to about those issues that you're dealing with. Not to for you to just go off through life thinking I'm gonna do it to do it all all by I'm just gonna do it by myself or God's gonna handle everything. And then oftentimes I, I think back on a, a story that my grandfather once told me it was about a man drowning and he was obviously he was getting ready to drown. Someone came in a boat ready to rescue him. He said, no, I'm waiting for God to come get me. Somebody else did the same exact thing on another on a bigger boat with a life jacket and everything. He said, "No, I'm still waiting for God to get me." The guy died. He drowned. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he went to heaven asking God, "Why didn't you come to save me?" Well, I sent two people down there for you. See, see, we don't want to really unpack these type of issues because now we're now these are, these are slippery slopes that we're on. People, because now. A counter <clears throat> had at some point in time, uh-huh, which leads uh-huh. me to my my next question in regards to the very issues that we're dealing with that 
obviously our pastors can't really fully speak to or even be special in, right? So we're entering or we're now concluding year two of this pandemic, which has disproportionately affected us in so many areas and ways that I, I can't even go off into a tangent to even discuss. But I want to talk about it from a mental health standpoint. So obviously dealing with the frustrations and the the overall just depression that we're in as far as being furloughed or losing our jobs outright, um, uh, our physical health, obviously, mm-hmm. from a physical standpoint, we've been disproportionately affected by it. More Black people have been affected by COVID than any other race, right? And and then the numbers speak to the amount of people who have died from this from a, from a percentage standpoint, not necessarily the numbers itself, but just from a percentage, we're ultimately affected by it more than anyone else is. And so, and then on top of that, dealing with the social unrest and social injustice that we're dealing with in this, in, this, in this country, preferably, but in this world too, because we've seen this travel to other countries now. We're seeing that civil unrest be brought, uh-huh. that, that, that protest against injustice is now universal. But even from that standpoint, there's so much, so much to deal with from an anxiety standpoint that it's not enough time in the day to even unpack all of this. So from you guys' pro- professional perspective, Romero, I'm gonna start with you. What, what ways do we even start to unpack how to deal with this, more specifically this pandemic that we have been disproportionately affected by? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot because mental health was skyrocketing before the pandemic. So over 40 million people in this country struggle with anxiety, over 14 struggle with depression, and the numbers are extremely high. And that was pre-pandemic. So then when you add in everything that has happened, as you mentioned, job loss, financial difficulties, losing someone to COVID, trying to balance out other health issues while also not trying to get COVID or having COVID and being worried about the implications there, social unrest and and a number of other things, I think the main thing to help manage all of these things is continuing to open the door to dialogue that we're all trying to navigate through this together. And I go back to um, Dak Prescott, um, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. He lost his brother to suicide at the beginning of the pandemic last year. And I'll never forget this. He had a press conference and they were asking him how he was doing and he was honest. Uh, which sometimes athletes don't feel comfortable with this level of vulnerability, especially publicly. I I respect the hell out of him because he said, I'm not going to lie to you. I was battling depression. And he talked about it as related to losing his brother, but he also talked about the human element that the pandemic naturally Uh caused the disconnect where we weren't able to connect with family and friends as easily as we were able to before and a number of other things. So he talked about the social isolation that resulted from that. And um, he said, I'm not going to lie. Like I really battled depression and I really had a hard time. And it was very disappointing to see that there was reporters that were saying, Hey, Dak, don't you think that you bringing this up is going to affect how your team views your leadership. And then we even have some pretty, pretty popular analysts, particularly on ESPN, who also said the same thing. Like, I don't think he should have did that. And I think that's really upsetting because the man just lost his brother to suicide. And he's telling you that I'm struggling not only with that, but I'm also struggling with all these changes that the pandemic has caused. And there's individuals questioning his leadership, his manhood. David, you mentioned like this whole man up mentality And what in all of what he said is anything less than him being a man and him talking about the difficulties that he experienced? I mean, being human. I mean, being human, exactly. And he said that connection that he had, and a a very strong connection that he had with his brother. I think he, I believe, he has two brothers, and so losing that brother, I know what it was like losing a brother. I'm still dealing with that myself personally, so I can only imagine him being in a public eye like this, having to deal with this, still maintaining mm-hmm. a certain level of professionalism in his <coughs> sport, still having to go out there and still battle 
even in the midst of internally dealing with that type of issue and for people to yeah. question that, 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 that pisses me off to know people even question something like that as if they haven't lost someone close to them, especially exactly. the suicide of all. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Exactly. And what that sparked though, even though it highlighted how we still have a long way to go, it also sparked dialogue to say, if Dak Prescott can stand there and even despite the reporter, despite the reporters and other people giving him a hard time, if he could stand there and say what he said, and in addition, tell them, hey, I don't think my team is going to view me as less of a leader as a man at all. In fact, I think they're going to respect me for talking about these things. And they actually did. And that opened up dialogue for other athletes and other individuals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm struggling too. And that's where we get healing too is when people can come together and open up those lines of communication and really talk about when individuals are struggling and experiencing difficulties but then utilize one another to say hey this is how we can get through this we can do this together and it starts with just having the conversation we we do this a lot in suicide prevention where is having the conversation is so critical to eventually getting people to a place where those thoughts decrease significantly. A lot of it is like that feeling of being alone and not having people to talk to. And so I think that's one of the most important things. And then really prioritizing self-care. Like we know this all from our jobs of how a lot of, a lot of companies are looking at, well, working from home actually did not decrease productivity. In a lot of ways, it actually increased productivity. You know so you got a lot of businesses and companies and even investors that are like, in what ways can we improve self-care in the workforce and amongst other individuals? And that's something that we have to prioritize as an individual, work, 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 burn yourself out trying to meet all these different demands and there's not enough time. Capitalism. Exactly. And there's also a lot of support, too, for individuals to properly Mm -hmm. care themselves. So I think that, in addition to open up more lines of communication, is going to be critical. And we've seen that it has been effective when it's done. Yeah. And and to that point, too. So, David, so Romero touched bases a little bit on the social aspect of it, right? So the social uh, isolation that has been that we've all been having to deal with throughout this Mm -hmm. now two years being this pandemic. It's been critical for especially even extroverts. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, even introverts even miss being out sometimes, right? So it's like, you know, obviously, being an extrovert myself, I have introvert tendencies. I tend to want to be by myself every now and then, but I, I enjoy socializing and being around people when it comes to that. And so mm-hmm. this pandemic affected that uh, a, a huge amount. A lot. Not yes. being able to interact with friends and family enough and not be able to go to different events. Some of those things that that we oftentimes look at now that we realize we took for granted in some aspects of that mm-hmm. we came from a from that social uh, social convention standpoint. But for you, what, in your professional uh, perspective, as far as dealing with this pandemic, what what ways would you would you expound on in reference to what Romero said about just having an open dialogue, being open and available and vulnerable? to speak about this because a lot of people are dealing with these things alone. Now, and it, it made me feel rather bad for those who are single and don't have kids or a spouse to even deal with this pandemic and they having to just be alone in their own house or apartment, or whatever, mm-hmm. having to sit in this and just literally deal with it by themselves. That And that, that's something that's been very critical, especially in the black community. And so from your standpoint, what would you say can, can be some of those steps that we can deal with this because we're not out of this pandemic right now. We're, we're uh-uh. making strides, but we're not quite out of it just yet. So, I mean, still being in the midst of it, it's still a rather difficult situation to be in. So from your standpoint, what, what would you say to that? There was this meme going around in the pandemic and it, and, and, uh, and, and it said also the lines of, you know, take this quarantine time to, you know, create new ideas or to build your business. And you know what I said to that? That's some bullshit. Yeah. Take this time to, to survive and thrive. Yeah. Take this time to, to, to like, you know, if you know, if you need to sit down and not do anything, sit your ass down and don't do shit. Exactly. And it's because, okay. And it's okay to do that. Every now you, you need that break. 
from everything. Yes. yes, because this pandemic is taking a toll on all of us, yeah. mentally, physically, and emotionally. You don't have to be motivated to do anything this pandemic. And if you come out of the pandemic without a brand new idea or a new job or whatever, that is okay. You came through the pandemic. Absolutely. That within itself is is so rewarding. I would say just be okay. Yes. Gotta be okay with just like surviving. You don't, you know, you don't always have to thrive. Thriving takes energy. Yeah. Now that we're coming out of it, you know, you need to do to take care of your mental health. You need to go out and socialize, do that. But, you know, don't let folks pressure you into looking down on yourself for not, you know, being, quote unquote, their idea of productive during, the, during this pandemic. Absolutely, because everyone, and it's the thing too, everyone don't have the drive or the, yeah. or that ambitious fervor that's, that's within them to be able to thrive and be productive mm-hmm. in that aspect, mm-hmm. like from an economical standpoint. So some people what was not it, uh, as affected by this pandemic. Some people obviously gained jobs in certain aspects. I mean, mm-hmm. Me mm-hmm. with technology, you know, obviously I, I didn't have that issue to have to deal with, but I had other aspects of my life that was affected by this pandemic. And so that's, that's not to be dismissed or discredited, but it's more so about, okay, that's me and, and, and what issues I have to deal with because we all have been affected by it some form of way. Some of us may have been affected by it the same exact ways as others versus others, mm-hmm. just like one or two ways where that social aspect has been mostly across the board for everyone. Right. So it's yeah. having to put on the mask if you do go out or just the idea of, you know, now being the norm. It's like now you can't go anywhere without even thinking about it. Now, now it's not even a thought anymore. We've been wearing a mask so goddamn mm-hmm. much that it's like now I already know I, I need to have it on versus. Yeah. Yeah. OK. It used to be a point in time where I can just breathe freely and not have to worry about this. And not everyone who's fully vaccinated or wearing masks wants to do that. But in order to keep ourselves sane and safe from those who are careless and reckless throughout this damn pandemic. We want to make sure we take all the ex- extraneous measures to make sure that we're safe and make sure our families mm-hmm. are, safe to, are safe as well. So that within itself, that, that drives anxiety up the damn roof. Yes. And it's like, yes. okay, man, what else is new? And being for, for black yeah. people, or more specifically black men, it's mm-hmm. you know having to deal with the fact of, okay, I just lost my job. I may have just lost a loved one to this, to this COVID. I'm getting sick. Now I'm worried about if I got COVID or not. That would that thought within itself would just be like, oh man. Okay. Mm-hmm. I just hope it ain't that. And that's just where your mind first go. Now I recently I was uh, obviously sick with strep throat. And when I went to uh I went to emergency uh a care, uh I mean urgent care rather, and doctor told me that it may be COVID. I had to wait a few minutes to get my test results back. She had obviously mm-hmm. tested me for the flu came back it was a it may have been a false negative then she tested me again i had to wait a couple of days while i was still enduring this this ailment i'm still thinking to myself man please don't let this be covid even though i'm fully vaccinated i know i can fight it off i just don't want to have to deal with it though but yes, you came I'm back brilliant. and have it it's like thank you god mm-hmm. okay let me just make sure that i just get myself better because now i i, I have to be I can't be around my family now. I can't be around my wife and my kids because of that, because I don't want to get them infected. And so all those different things just take a mental and an emotional toll on you mm-hmm. to have yeah. to deal with. And so not being able to be your best self is oftentimes something that we've been dealing with for the past two years, more so than any other time. But even still, pre-pandemic, we were still dealing with the idea of just being Black, Black men. And it's Oh, it's been exhausting, I, I, to say the least. Now, something that um, Romero and I talk, touched a little bit on before the show started, too, was that we're seeing a lot of times, at least for me, I'm seeing mm-hmm. a lot of times where people are somewhat using, you know, um, uh, mental health, if you will, or their anxiety as somewhat of, an, uh, of a way to get out of certain things. Not, not necessarily question whether or not they're actually dealing with something because everyone is dealing with something, some form of way, right, in their lives. But mm-hmm. to, your, to your standpoint, David, would you say, or how do I want to word this question without 
coming off as insensitive to someone's, you know, obviously mental state. Would you say that some people have used mental health as a cop out or as a way of getting out of stuff? <laughs> I've seen the media okay. <laughs> allow white people to accuse mental health to get out of shit that black people get punished for. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I never want to minimize someone's fight with their mental health. Absolutely. And so for me, I, I tread lightly in, in talking about it unless, unless I can sit down and, 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 and assess them myself. Yeah. Um, because you never know what someone's dealing with regard to mental health and how debilitating that may be. We you and I may have the same diagnosis. Yeah. But it may impact us differently. And so um I don't I want I I have to you know, I want to be careful about saying that, you know, someone's using this human as a crutch. Yeah. That's just that's just, you know, um my standpoint on it. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes definitely, yeah, definitely makes sense. And uh, you know what, Romero touched on it a little bit when he said mm. he gave me the clinical term that I I wasn't familiar with when it came to that. So um, let me make sure I'm quote Romero right this time. <laughs> he, he called it um, a factitious disorder. Is that correct? So there's malingering, and then there's factitious disorder. So you have malingering, okay. where individuals will make up you know, illnesses or symptoms or things like that for a yeah. particular gain. And then you yeah, have yeah. Vicious, where that will happen and there's no gain involved. Um, so there's both of the kind of the same behaviors going on. It's just one is for a personal yeah. gain or for a particular purpose. And then the other one is for no purpose at all, per se. So that does happen. Um, mm -hmm. So again, you know, being sensitive to everyone, um, you know, sometimes that can happen. However, you know, I think, especially as mental health professionals, we always look at it as if someone is saying that, you know, they're struggling with something, um, you know, try to take it seriously, you know, and try to be there and be as much of a resource as possible. Because I think sometimes individuals will shut down them being a resource to someone because there is this worry that the person is doing it for attention and a number of other things. And again, looking at mental health as well as suicide data, um, particularly if you look at suicide, over 90% of people who attempt suicide told someone in the days and weeks leading up to yes. it. Mm -hmm. and it's not always taken seriously. And, you know, a lot of times yeah. those attempts can then lead to, you know, people dying by suicide. And so anytime somebody's struggling or, or, or saying that they need help, try to be that resource or connect them to a resource as much as possible. And then once they're assessed, a mental health professional will kind of determine, you know, what's going on there. Now, now, now my, one of my last questions to you guys is, is pretty critical to just the overall resource, if you will, that's available to our black community. Right? Yeah. So what, what do you say to people who don't have the means to be able to, you know, really fully go out there and, and, and look for that, uh, that very help that they need to help them deal with their anxiety and, and their mental health issues. David, I'll start with you on that. Um, well, some people find me on Psychology Today. Okay. Um, and so um, that's an avenue. And word of mouth. Um, I get a lot of referrals by word of mouth as well. And I got to give it up to the Divine Nine. So all, the, all the organizations are having initiatives about mental health. And and so we could do more. Absolutely. But I, I think that that's a really good avenue to pursue, and especially when a lot of your Black counseling professionals are Greek uh, um, affiliated. Yeah. And then you, yeah. And, yeah, and then um, got the um, Kappa in New York City who's starting the, the, the counseling center. Uh, there are a couple of Kappas that started counseling centers in New York City for Black men. And so, you know, there are resources out there for, for us. Um, so, so just, I think we need to do better of advertising those resources. Mm -hmm. And, and there are a lot of clergy, the black clergy out there that are, that are very sensitive to mental health needs and, and, and can refer to folks. Um, so I would say try all those avenues, it, it, you know, and, 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 and don't stop trying until you, um, 
you you find something. But we have to do the work to also bring the mountain to Muhammad. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and we have to do the work to make sure that the people know about these resources and, and, and take these resources to the people that need them. So we got to go out to the communities and, 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 and have a bullhorn and be loud about it too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's a lot of ways to kind of avoid some of the, the common barriers, like finances, for instance. There's a mm-hmm. lot of providers that operate on the sliding fees. Um, and so there's a lot of providers that make counseling as affordable as possible. So whether it's financially, representation, to David's point, you could go on psychologytoday.com. You can actually filter out the therapist based on background and preferences. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's actually a great, great website. Um, and then I'm more in a university setting. Um, and so we do a ton of outreach, particularly um, to minority populations and underserved populations to ensure that they are fully aware of the fact that we're here, we're here to support. And um, in a lot of ways that has been very successful by word of mouth is you meet with um, a black woman or a black man and they have a good experience and they go back to the community because especially in our community, it's about trust. Right. Yes. Vigil can come back and say, hey, I went there and I had a great experience. And by the way, they have therapists that look like us. That that's huge for a lot of people. And so I think all those things combined, including what David said, um, you know, can play a significant role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, would you guys say that um, social media has also been a sort of a, a helpful tool when it comes to word of mouth, too? Have you guys been reached out to in regards to just helpful advice from a as professional black men in, in this profession, have you guys been asked, you know, certain professional questions or just from your expertise, just what 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 indeed they can actually do to help, you know, better assess, uh, I guess, administer some type of uh, counseling advice to those people who, uh, who may reach out to you. And I've gotten uh, people. Go ahead, David. Go ahead, Vigil. You're muted, brother. You're on mute, Marlon. Okay, there we go. It was on, um, yeah, it dropped a little bit. But anyway, yeah, you were saying that you have been reached out to on social media, David? Yeah, uh, you know, people reached out to me about becoming a counselor. And, wow. um, and, and, and I'm always happy to have the conversation with another black or brown man, you know, about how to actually get into our profession. I talk about, you know, there are several routes you can take. There's, 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 there's counseling, there's social work, there's psychology. And um, I talk about the networks that are involved, right? You know, we, we have a, a group meet that is just for Black men in counseling. I got to add you, Romero, because you got to, you know, um, it's, 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 just, it, it's just a space for Black men to support each other that are in the counseling profession. Um, you know, whether we're at the, the master's level, the doctoral level, there's always something in there that 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 will assist you, support you. This is space for you to come in and vent, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I always get questions about either becoming a member of the profession or how to get through your graduate program or how to get into a doctoral program to 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 to, to teach or to be a professional at the doctoral level. And so social media for me is a way to support those that are in the profession or to want to come into the profession. Okay. And you know, that's a great way of networking, too. You know, especially when you guys are all over the, you know, all over the world. And so referrals can happen that way too. So if you, if you come yes, yes. someone who's in one city that you may be familiar with, an uh, individual, uh, a black man, preferably who was in the uh, mental mm-hmm. field, who's in that city, you can refer them to them, right? And so, oh you yes, know, use those avenues as best as you can is always helpful, and especially getting the word out to more and more mm-hmm. black people to to seek that that. Professional <laughs> so I appreciate that. Remember, for you, has there, has there been any any outreach uh, from a social media standpoint from you? Definitely. So I would say through social media, or mm-hmm. sometimes to be honest, I I don't know how people find me. Um, and they're just like, oh, I, I, I noticed you're interested in this or you have a specialty in this. No. And I, I'll get random email, um, even through my work email address um, about those same things. Um, 
So just the world that we live in, it's it's allowed us to be more connected than we've ever been in a lot of ways, although we can all admit it's also disconnected us in a number of ways. But I will say the good in it is exactly what we're talking about now is um, people being interested in how to get through graduate and professional school, people being interested in therapy, as David mentioned, um, but also people just wanting more trainings and more opportunities to increase awareness about the topics that we've talked about today, as well as other mental health related things. So I think it's been helpful in, in a lot of different ways. And we also see the impact. Um, the more we talk about this issue, and again, I, I look at the research a lot related to these things, and particularly states that fully fund mental health awareness, you see it reflect issues in suicide data continue to have the dialogue, which is another reason why I'm, I'm grateful that you invited us to, to speak with you today. Yeah, man, yeah, this man. has been an honor and a, pri a privilege to talk to you guys, and I appreciate and commend tremendously the, the very works that you guys are doing to help move our culture forward from your profession. And as Black men, you know, like I said, representation matters. And to see more of us, hopefully, in the near future, getting more involved and getting into this profession is going to definitely be the the, the very help that we'll need from ourselves and being able to help each other out and in, in, in pushing that agenda to unpack the very issues that we've been dealing with for far too long. And that's been plaguing us and hindering us from mm -hmm. even getting to getting even further along in life because we have so yeah. much to unpack. It's just breaking those generational curses, a lot of those traumatic events that have happened in our lives that we haven't forgiven friends and loved ones and such and such for. So those types of things are coming to the forefront, which I do appreciate the very works that you guys are doing to help contribute towards that and advocating for more of us to, to, to be able to open up more emotionally because that, that's been helpful. Um, uh, like well, I said, can I add something real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Because I know you and I connect on, you know, growing up in Chicago. And, and I think uh, this goes beyond just mental health. I think it's also about encouraging one another to show hey, you can come from very humble beginnings and you can be confronted with so many different difficulties. Yeah, mm -hmm. You can make it in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, and to be able to encourage other people to show them how you made it, how you navigated through some pretty challenging situations and not just on a thriving perspective, but on just the day-to-day -day challenge that we all have to manage. Um, and I really connected with what you said about how like every single day presents its own challenge. And I know for me, I had to cut off news notifications off my phone because I would wake up in the morning, I would see the notifications. I'm like CNN headlines. And you see some of the things that, you know, is going on in the world and that will mess up your whole day. Your and whole so, day. It, it does. You know? And I, and I, and I've, listen, like I said, my wife, you and I, you and I both know my wife because obviously your wife works with my wife. So being, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny enough, I want to make sure I, I, I point this out too. So my very first episode of this podcast was on yeah. mental health from the perspective of the black woman. And that was interviewing my wife and your wife too, uh, Romero, on this show in regards yeah. to that. And they uncovered so many different things too that I appreciate them for that. And no, they didn't tell me to say that. I'm saying that on my own uh, recognizance. So, you know, whatever. Right. Anyway, anyway, I do appreciate you guys pretty much, you know, chiming in on it from a black man's perspective because a lot of times we, we don't get heard enough. And, and again, speaking about that representation, when it's not enough of us being represented, how can we really say there's a voice for us out here that's basically representing us in, in, in that in that way? Because we have everyday issues that we're dealing with. And to your point, I I, I too have to like turn off notifications on my phone because it, the news is so daunting and just so unfortunate. A lot of times, it's just like, how do I deal with that now? Fresh on my mind, this early in the morning, I just woke up and I'm seeing this now. Like, okay. Yeah. Now I'm taking on the frustrations of the world and it yes. me into yes. my own life. And it's like, that's affecting my mood. Now I can't really be my best self in that day because of what's going on in the world that I have to pay attention to. And too much information, and now I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Denzel Washington when he says this, he said, well, too much, too much water, you'll drown. You drink too much water, you'll drown, right? So from that perspective, if you consume so much of this information, it's going to drive your anxiety through the roof. So that's why we have to be in moderation of everything, right? Things, 
it, it, in moderation would obviously help us cope with the everyday mm. that we have to deal with as black people, preferably black men. So if we do that and we're much more cognizant of doing that, then I think the days oftentimes will ultimately get better for us. But again, yeah. making the conscious decision to do that, that we have to eventually get to a place where it's we're normalizing that. Now, it takes yeah. 21 days to develop a habit and habits become lifestyles. And we have to make sure that we're normalizing this type of lifestyle okay. into our everyday lives so that we can have much more of a balance within our lives. We can have mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we deal with issues, but it not just completely just put us in such a mood that we're like, okay, we're defeated already. And, and, the, and the fight just started. It's like being able to unpack that is something that's very, it's a paramount of importance. And I appreciate, again, I can't thank yeah. you brothers enough for being the men that you are in your professions doing what you're doing, because like I said, it's not enough of us in it. And I hope moving forward that initiative gets pushed out to basically get more recruitment into this. Yes. Yeah. Because it's neat. Yes. Because it's, it's not, too many issues, not enough of us in the profession to deal with them all. Right. So again, my, my hat is, is tipped to you guys for the many works that you all are doing in this area. And I hope that you all continue on. I know that uh, I researched that, you know, the mental health month is May, but the minority or the black mental health month is uh, July, I believe. So I'll definitely be uh, circling back with you gentlemen to have you on. Please do, man. Please do. Talk I'm more sorry. about it too, because hopefully by then we were at least dealt with the issues of the pandemic. Now we can move on to normalizing a new society that we can live in functionally as a black mm -hmm. people, preferably, prefer, preferably black men. So yeah, I'll definitely be having you guys again on the show and talk more in depth about those uh, instances. Hopefully we can get past this particular one and then be able to really unfold the cultural issues that we have to unpack. Absolutely. Yeah, I look forward awesome. to that, man. Oh, yeah. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and again, make sure you, you like, share, subscribe to my YouTube page. Make sure you also like, share, subscribe to my uh, my Instagram page, Speak to the Mic uh, Podcast Show. Also on Facebook, it's Speak to the Mic Podcast Show as well. As I produce more and more content out here, I'm talking about the very issues that, that's plaguing our community, I'm putting out this information out there to start the conversation and, and bring forth that initiative that we each collectively can be involved in and helping ourselves push this culture forward together because it's going to take all of us to do our part. Yeah. Again, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all for us, brother. being on the show and definitely we'll circle back and, and have more of the talks about our mental health moving forward. Be blessed, brothers. Yeah. Be blessed, hey, brother. You too. Appreciate y'all for that. If you like what you've heard from this week's episode and would like to hear more from previous episodes, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel below. You can also find me on social media platforms at speak to the mic underscore podcast show on Instagram and speak to the mic podcast show on Facebook. Be sure to also like, share, subscribe to my Spotify page at speak to the mic podcast show. As I put out more thought provoking content, your opinion and thoughts are needed and appreciated. I thank you all in advance for your support and look forward to hearing from you soon.